Trump and I were talking about what might be useful, some of the comments. And, and basically, I, I, this chop talk is sort of like old PR, new PR. Because when I first got involved with this industry on the consulting side, I joined a company called Regis McKenna Inc. And Regis, this is in, 19, it was in 1986. And at that time, high tech marketing was just getting invented. And it was getting invented around PR. And prior to that, when you said marketing, people thought Procter & Gamble and they thought advertising. And it was pretty clear that advertising was not the way to work because people were making buying decisions with significant consequences and ads didn't have any credibility with them. So, so Regis sort of started that first thing about, about PR. And, and, and the way it would work is he had a really interesting model. I brought it with me. This is 1986, uh, not very digital as you can see, but it was called the infrastructure model and it probably made $100 million, okay? So that's not bad for a model, right? Uh, maybe more. So basically all it said was at the top of this triangle are your prospective customers, the people that you want to reach out to you. At the bottom is you. And the, and the idea was you can, you can run and run an ad, which means you jump over everybody in the model and you go to the top and you say, hi, I'm important by name. And but what happens is, even if you do that, what these people do is, I don't know if I should buy you or not, have I read anything about you in the press? So that was the first idea. And by the way, there were technical people and there were business people. So the technical people would read the technical trade press, so they'd read Computer World or, or whatever, the, these are magazines you never heard of, but at the time they were important. <laughs> and this was Business Week, which is also a magazine which went out of business recently. But, but so that these guys would read the business press and these guys would read the technical press. So he said, okay, I'll go, I'll go do a press tour first, right? Then, we'll, then we can get the buy. We got, well, hang on. The press guys, when they did their job, would call the analysts because they'd say, well, who the heck are these guys? Are they any good? And so the analysts on this side were the industry analysts, so that was the Gardner Group and Forrester and those people. And the analysts on this side were the financial analysts. So that was Morgan Stanley, Goldman, and the Lehman Brothers. You remember Lehman, right? And that was back when analysts were part of, uh, legally part of the thing. And so the analysts, and they said, well, but what would the analysts do? So the analysts would end up talking to third parties in the industry, they talk to your competitors about you, and they talk to your partners about you. And so the idea is, well, maybe you ought to go brief your partners, and then by the way, they would talk to your customers, your current customers. And so the whole idea of this model is, people were gonna check your credibility going down the infrastructure model. So a product launch, which should go up the infrastructure model. And we just did a series of things. You had long leads, you had short leads, you had briefings, you had white papers, you had all that stuff. It was all organized by this triangle, and it ran a business for at least a decade. And it was a very, very successful model. So, Regis McKenna, by the way, no longer exists. It's sort of like book industry, or, you know, I mean, these, these Kodak, I mean, these wonderful brands. What happened? Well, what happened was, we completely disintermediated. The digital infrastructure has completely changed the rules, which is what, which is what brings us together here today. But that model there, what you, the, way I, the metaphor I would give you for it is, you had a new product launch. And it was all around product launches, by the way. Product launch was, the, was the, the complete currency of PR. You could launch a company, but basically, they really didn't care about your company because who would have heard of it, but they cared about the product. But the, I used to think of these as like little seedlings, and like you'd plant the seedling, and you'd water the seedling, and you'd bring people over to tend the seedling, and whatever. And, and it was sort of like the parable of the sowers in the Bible. Some of the seedlings fell on thorny ground, and they didn't go anywhere, and some were on the path. But some fell on fertile ground, and 30 times, 60 times, 100 times, whatever. Uh, big returns, big returns. And that model, so that was the model we used, and I'll tell you a personal case study about the transition from, away from that model. So I've written six books, as, as Sharon mentioned. So Crossing the Chasm was self-launched, but, but I did it with a Regis-style thing. I went to the, I, went, I got KPMG, Pete Marwick to give bread business breakfast, and I sort of started building it up through them, and we kind of, we went out to the rest of the infrastructure over a while. But Inside the Tornado, which was the next book, I did a complete self-funded launch, and it worked like a charm. I, I, I had big coverage in all the business in all the business press. It was cool. I had a cool picture of me in Business Week, and Reese still has a copy of it next. Reese was score. <laughs> really, really, really good, really good. And I wrote a third book called The Gorilla Game, and we launched that one more through the financial analyst, and that also score. That was about uh, buying stocks. The fourth book was called Living on the Fault Line, and it came out. We did the same program, nothing. 
Well, it was 2001. Frankly, business books went from being like cool to there, you know, if people want to get as far away from business books as they could, so you thought, okay, you know, it's a write-off, just move on. Nothing to hear see people, just keep moving. Uh, the next book was dealing with Darwin. And, you know, we did the complete launch. And frankly, not much. There was some, there was some, but you know, it was like, hmm, wow, that was kind of a mild event. So we came to the last one, it's Escape Velocity. And I thought, you know what? It's digital, Jeffrey, and I'm a lady doctor, and I was not on Twitter, and I didn't, it wasn't blog, I wasn't doing any of that stuff, and I thought, okay, 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 okay. Jeffrey, suck it up. Okay. So I get the Twitter account, I'm going to do the whole digital thing, but I think I can't do the whole digital thing and do the traditional launch. But, the, but my publisher said, don't worry, we'll handle the traditional launch. This is what we know how to do, not to worry. <laughs> yeah, right. Right, so basically, they did the traditional launch. Nothing. Not one interview, nothing. So you went back and you said, well, what did you do? Well, I called all the editors. So right, so calling was the idea, that was what would check the box. As soon as you asked for an interview, you were basically, you had fulfilled your, so this is, an, or what happened was this model is now completely bankrupt at this point. So, so you say, okay, well, if that's bankrupt, what's going on? Well, as we know, PR has actually never been stronger. It just, that's not how you activate PR. That's not, what, that's not how it happens. So what's happening, and I now think of PR as like, if I thought of the four before it was like the seedling, now I think of it as like a dandelion puff. You go, and it's like there are dandelion seeds going everywhere. Where the hell are they? I don't know. But somewhere, I bet something's becoming a dandelion. I just don't know where it is. So, 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 how, so you see, so like, how do you, and that's kind of what air PR, that's kind of what got us excited about air PR and, and more data. Because the deal is, where have all the flowers gone? I mean, it really is a version of, of where are these little, these little, they're not even seedlings, they're just possibilities out in the, in the digital universe. And so the job now of PR at the beginning has changed dramatically. By the way, by the time we get to the end, I don't think it's changed at all. But at the beginning, it's like, where's the garden? If I'm going to have a garden, where's the garden? And you can't detect the garden manually. You have to detect the garden using big data and analytics. You can't find the garden. You can't measure how well your garden's doing. You have no sense of the world. Because it used to be, the old PR was a completely anecdotal business. When you did an external audit, which is how you measured the success of PR, you essentially called 20 people. And you kind of called a different 20 people each time, but they were kind of, they were in the sort of people in the know, and it worked. Because after about six or seven phone calls, you start hearing, a couple of these three themes. And by the time it was 15, it was like, okay, okay. So you could come back to the client and with an enormous amount of confidence, you could say, this is your position. These are the people ahead of you in line. These are the people behind you in line. This is what they think of you. This is what they like about you. This is what they don't like about you. Because this that's how the story circulated. Narratives re reinforce each other and they get repeated. As they get repeated, they start getting more and more similar and you get a position that consolidates. The problem in the digital world is that is actually happening, but it's happening like a mosaic. So it's, it's happening at such a fragmented level, you can't see it. But ultimately, that same image is emerging. You have a reputation. You just can't locate it, and you can't locate it anecdotally, at least not at the beginning. Now, once you begin to use the, the digital tool set, and you begin to extract, when you, when you use the digital tool set, by the way, you just, you, you get an awful lot of signal, most of which is noise, right? You get, it's like, what? And it's a little bit like you think of those paintings and say, if you stare at this painting long enough, you will see the Eiffel Tower. You know, and you, your eyes have to sort of blur a little bit. And go, and, but eventually you do, and you go, oh yeah, I, I, I see what's happening. And so once you can abstract out the essence of that idea or that message or that narrative, and you start retelling that narrative, it has enormous success. Because now what you're actually doing is you're verifying something that, that everybody's kind of sensing in the zeitgeist, and now you're just articulating it more and more clearly. We were talking about this concept called system of engagement. So when systems of engagement kind of came out, it just helped clarify something that people said, yeah, yeah, I've seen that, I've seen that, I've seen that. So PR at the end of the day is about nurturing seedlings. You have to get the story. The human beings live by stories. Our whole, we explain the world to ourselves through narratives. So the narrative, the need for narrative has never changed and, and, and being creative with narrative and being critical of narrative, so you don't, so you don't publish absurd narratives or self-serving narratives, you publish narratives that actually resonate. That skill 
it is still at the core of PR, and that has not changed. But the anecdote, the notion that you could that you could instrument the, the, this experience anecdotally, it's not that there aren't anecdotes, and it's not that they don't help. But in a digital world, it's not enough. It's just not enough. You have to have this 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 extra reach. And so what, what what's exciting about um, about what's going on with PR is, and you'll hear a bunch of stuff that I think Shram and Rebecca and folks will talk about it, is how do you, without abandoning the, the, the core business, which is essentially storytellers, basically, you, do any of you guys read Ender's Game or any of the Orson Scott card? Okay, good. So Ender's is called, at one point, called Speaker for the Dead, which you, sometimes you find yourself actually <laughs> <laughs> It's a price not dead. It's mostly dead. This product is partly alive. Okay, but 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 but, but engineers in particular often need speakers for their products because they can make them, but they can't tell their story. So that that part doesn't change. But this other part, this other part does. And so I just want to maybe just and I'd love to kind of kick around these ideas with you. Let me just kind of close with a couple of last thoughts. But that's the key thought. The key thought then is the front end of this thing, the top of the funnel, the place where the where the signal is most dispersed. We need the digital. We need digital tools to help us hear the first the, the, the first set of impressions. Ultimately, we still have to distill those impressions. I still think that's a wet wear thing. I do not think I would not have want to invest in an artificial intelligence engine that is supposed to abstract narratives from the world and tell the story <laughs> for you. Okay, I, I think it's actually possible. I just think they'll be kind of crappy stories. Okay, and they won't. They certainly will not be very nuanced stories. So, but 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 but, the, but this notion of bringing it in. So this PR ROI idea. Just just one last thought about it. When you hear ROI, the first person you think of is the CFO. And and the CFO is going to be thinking about return on investment. And at some level, you've got to play that game because the CFO has all the dollars. Just in case you hadn't caught up on that. So, so you, you you do have to throw that dog a bone. But at the end of the day, that's not what it's about. It's about the CMO. And the CMO may, we Sean and I were talking about this, they may get compensated on things like what they call contrib and whatever, and we'll talk about that. But at the end of the day, what the CMO wants to know is what the hell is really going on? And that's what PR ROI tool is really about, is what the hell is really going on? And, 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 and how can I detect patterns in this system because what, I think there's enormous confidence in the marketing community that if I can see the pattern, I can manipulate the pattern. I can move the pattern. I can either change my company, change my offer, change my story. You know, I, I can do something. But if I can't see the pattern, I'm just sort of speaking out into the Grand Canyon, hoping an echo comes back at some point. That, that's, you know, that's that whole thing about open loop marketing. And, and all my life, marketing has largely been an open loop process. You spent money and you kind of hoped. And, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. And you, of course, claim credit when it did. And you explain away why it didn't. But, but the truth was you just didn't know. It just, it just, it was whatever. So, so I think it's important that we not do that. I think what's really cool about the digital world is there, it, with big data and analytics, there is a level of accountability. Now, it, it, I don't want to overstate it. And I hope when you guys come out with this, you don't overstate it. Because if you overstate the quantitative, you can get to a point where people just start gaming the system, and then it's like it's just then it's just it's another form of lying, right? And, and I want to keep the forms of lying that I'm used to. Right? <laughs> so, but I I, I, so I I think you have to have qualitative and quantitative, and I, and I think what I think the thing I would just the point I would just make is, um, you know, most of my career was like 95% qualitative, 5% quantitative. And I think what the Google guys have sort of changed the rules. And they've just said, look, that's just not acceptable. It's just not acceptable. If we can have a self-driving car, you can do better than 95.5. So I, so I think it's got to get back to 50-50, uh, 60-40. I don't think it should be 20-80 in either direction. Because I just feel like, I feel like the, 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 core, the storytelling is still the core, the core of the discipline. And, and frankly, the, you know, it's really interesting. We keep on talking about STEM in our society right now. Like everybody's got to have a STEM education. Because if you don't have STEM, you can't make the internet, which is true. But if you don't have the liberal arts, you can't use the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's not, the whole point of the internet is to tell stories, right? And so, so if you guys are storytellers. So those are some thoughts. Just, I'd love to get your reactions or as you're thinking about stuff, how this relates to your world. But the, the fundamental message is we have to have a quant front end to a call back. That we've got to find a way as professionals and as an industry to navigate that back and forth.
Thoughts? Push back or, yeah, I got a plus here, that's good. <laughs> Coming in. But as you're thinking about what you're doing, where are you? Where is your, where, where is your world? So, so in, one of my narratives around is uh, market imbalance, quantitative and qualitative, both with our measurements of this, with the stock market, yes. even we're getting killed yeah. on our short-term outlooks. You yeah. know, um, but the pushback there is actually what I believe is accountability, which has always been the pushback from the PR people that I've worked with, yes. which is we, we don't know what's gonna happen, so I don't wanna be responsible for that outcome. Now being held responsible, well, the balance of power has shifted. So right. customers now have that, they have infinite choice, including marketplaces where they can get independent. Right. Um, so how do we actually encourage people to understand that the accountability component is here to stay and to accept the responsibility for their work? So I, th I think, I, I, so there is a part, there is a certain class of person who just doesn't want to be accountable. And frankly, this system is designed to actually push those people aside. Because if you're not willing to be accountable, I'm sorry, you shouldn't get the money. But I think the more it concerning issue is, I have one system of accountability. It's easy for me to be accountable to the short-term objectives, but it's hard to measure the long-term objectives. So I have what appears to be genuine accountability here and faux accountability here. When the truth is, I have to be accountable to both of these things. I just don't have a very good accountability metric mechanism over here. In the absence of a good mechanism, money will all drift to this side. So this is why we were having this conversation where, where the money goes to the advertising side because I, can, I have digital data, I can prove the validity of it. I try to bring it over here for some more long-term positioning. We know goddamn well long-term positioning matters a ton, but I can't measure it and send the guy says, well, you, I want more money, and you go, well, why? And, and, and so, so I think that's the piece that we gotta, we gotta step up for. Yeah. So you fund, grow, invest in interesting companies, so there's portfolio company X. When do you tell them to, switch, to flip the switch to go do what you're describing? Well, I think it, de it depends on a lot on the industry. So for example, for a while we were doing life sciences and clean tech, and those are a different problem. But inside the IT world, then I think the thing is, is it, if it's more of a consumer play, you're gonna play one version of this game. If it's more of a B2B play, I think a lot of, of uh, more David investments are B2B investments. So basically, the B2B investment wants to end up looking like this. Mm -hmm. And so then, then the issue is simply, can, I, I, need, I need, so in the absence of having, having digital accountability, the default solution here was play the old game, you're just playing it half blind, which is crappy, but it was the only game in town, right? So, so now I think that the message back would be to say, look, supplement your, still play the PR game, but PR game for a startup is the core marketing communications game, unless there's something special about what you're doing that would make that different, but in general, but play it with a digital amplifier. Okay, so, so it's, it's, it's just, you know, you, you know, Bob Dylan started with acoustical guitars, he went rock, so can you. <laughs> Other thoughts? Other, yeah, yeah, please. You talked a bit about how the data. By the way, guys, I, you've noticed that guys, I, 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 just women, step up. I want some questions. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. You talked about how data is coming back to more of a cause effect relationship. How much do you feel like predictive analytics can be added to what you're describing so that you're actually learning? So, what it, what's really cool about predictive analytics is, is what counts for success in predictive analytics. Because I love, because we just went, we had a wonderful company go public last Friday called Rocket Fuel. They have predictive analytics, it's the core of their business model, right? But you know what that means? That means instead of being 98% wrong, your advertising is only 95% wrong. So I have, I have increased the efficiency of your advertising by 150%. But I haven't predicted, I've predicted, I've, so, and so predictive analytics to me is still about, is still about reducing the number of wrongs, not like personalized, I don't know about you, but I'm not having this personal experience with my ads on Facebook. I mean, it's just not working. But, but the point is, it's better. And so from the advertiser's point of view, it's like score. I've gotten twice the response I've ever gotten before. Yeah, you went from 2% to 4%. So that means 96% of the people blew you off. So, so I think we have to be, so I don't think predictive analytics in, in the sense of getting positives is, is the right answer. But in terms of increasing the yield on, on, on high volume things, it's fabulous, it, it, it's, it's a miracle. And will it eventually get to? Yeah, if, if, if you watch the Google car driving around, it, the Google car now drives better than I do, which was not, that was a lower bar. But, <laughs> but, 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 it, but eventually they'll drive better than Brian does. 
<laughs> and, 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 and the point, so will it get there? Yes. Do I believe ultimately a machine can outperform the human brain? Not a machine, but it's not a machine. You're competing against all machines. It's called a cloud for a reason, right? So basically, is there a time when predictive analytics can take the human mind? Probably, I, maybe conceivably in my lifetime, given that we're living an awful long time, but not, but not, this, not this decade, I don't think. And certainly not in this, in this, in this area right here. But the, talking about predictive analytics, and just the ideas that come to my brain are being a PR, being yep. a flack, right? Um, it's the targeting, and it's also this other discussion is the advertising versus PR because we're not; it's not the same. No. The credibility is not the no. same. The influence is not the no. same. And now, here's the here's the problem. One of the problems, though, is we played that PR card so abusively, we actually brought ourselves down to the level of the credibility of advertising. I mean, that's what you have to be careful with. So therefore, you have to say, you have to re-earn mm -hmm. that respect. That you did. That's, why we, that's why we did PR instead of advertising, right? Um, but we have to re-earn that respect by essentially, I, th I, I, I think, finding authentic voices that are genuinely third party and have genuine, genuine interests. So yeah, yeah. But, but the predictive analytics in terms of making things more efficient, it's great. I mean, it, it really is, it really is fabulous. When is the new Crossing the Chasm coming out? Oh, when's the new Crossing the Chasm coming out? Oh, thank you for asking. How can I get a copy? Yeah, how can I get a copy? Sign coffee. Okay. <laughs> more David out, more David out. <laughs> so, okay, so I'll, I'll just say a couple words. Well, so, yeah. so the, Crossing the Chasm was written in 1990. Uh, those companies are all gone. Uh, then it was rewritten in 1999. Uh, those companies are all gone. <laughs> Not quite, but, 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 but a lot of them are. So, so it's coming out in January. It's the same book. So if you read it before and you said, yeah, I want to refer it to a friend, it's the same story, it's the same models, but all the examples come from companies that are you know, alive and well and thriving today in 2013. So it's kind of, it's more fun for somebody who's under the age of like 60 uh, to, to, to read and, and say, okay, I, I got it. And it's, yeah, it's going to be, yeah. I, I was going to say in a bookstore near you, but I don't think there are any. Uh, <laughs> but it'll be on a Kindle or, or near you, which is what I suspect it'll, 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 how most people read it. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, Doc and everyone else has always pushed that the web is about relationships yeah. at its core. And we've known this. And obviously, we went right to the transactions because the money flowed that way. Uh, but at the birth of social, we really saw PR professionals with the opportunity because they're the ones telling stories and creating relationships. Yet somehow they didn't do it. In fact, when we went to try to reinvent the press release and create the social media press release, and I spent two, three years trying to do that, they rejected it wholesale right. as new and foreign and whatever else. Right. So how do you get the PR professional audience to cross the chasm into this modern mindset? Well, you may or may not. The, the thing that's really important, when you look at disruptions, and if like this, 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 we have this thing that the, the guys at Cognizant call the SMAC stack, social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. So you say those are four amazingly disruptive technologies. And then you ask, well, what are we disrupting? And there's, there's I, I, this model we're playing with right now says, well, are, am I disrupting my operating model? So basically I have the same, I have the same competitive advantage, I have the same business model, but I just have to learn to operate it differently. Are you disrupting my business model? Where in fact, so in advertising, for example, the ad agency always did the buying. But the ad agency is crappy at doing buying in a digital world. But that's how they get paid. So, so you can imagine business model disruption is even scarier than operating. And then there's just, just my whole identity change because I, I have no meaning anymore. So if you're a book publisher, there is no meaning to being a book publisher anymore. I mean, the two things you did was you did book launches, not very well, and, and you did, I'll get you into Barnes & Noble. Well, yeah, but you're the only person there when you go. So, so, so that's not the <laughs> <laughs> so, so the net of this, the net of this is, I think what you, you're pointing out is, we had, if we, if, if, if social had only been a change in our operating model, I think we probably would have figured it out. But at some point, people didn't know how to get paid for it, right? And so they, there was a change to their business model, and then it was like, oh man, I can't do that. And so it was like Kodak, you know, it's like digital photography. They invented the damn thing, but they could never figure out how to get paid. So their business model, they got, I think getting stuck in your business model is scary. By the way, I think every major player in tech is in trouble. Because if you look at the entire stack of, of the canonical stack of tech companies, their business model is all out of position. And their sales forces are all skewed to the high end, but all of the new stuff is happening in the middle of the market. 
So it's like, wow, tough, tough. So, but what, what will happen is I think that there'll be a new generation of PR firms that will just say, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we'll do it. Thank you very much. Thank you for playing. Go to your, go to your old age home and we'll try to keep you alive. <laughs> That's, that's the promise that children are making their parents these days. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to turn it back over to Shrub. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you.